I, I intentionally, when I ended the 21 days, I wanted to bring in uh, a speaker. I wanted to bring in an evangelist. I wanted to bring in someone that I felt like would maybe uh, 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 bring some fullness to the, the last several weeks. And I had one person in mind, and that is Joe Phillips. Joe has been, and listen, I want to say I believe in the fivefold gifts of the Holy Spirit to the church, Ephesians chapter 4. I believe that there's a place for the office of the evangelist as an avoid of the church. So we bring them through from time to time uh, to speak to our church. Joe's been here several times. was a huge help when I got COVID a few, a few years ago. But Joe has been a pastor. Uh, he's a district youth director from uh, Georgia and uh, been for the last several years just been evangelizing, preaches in some of our greatest churches here uh, in, in the Assemblies of God and other denominations. He's an evangelist. So I want to say this up front. At the end of the service, we're going to take an offering for him because evangelists don't get salaries from week to week. They are dependent upon the offerings of the local church. So I'll mention that just briefly at the end. So maybe God would speak to you while Joe is ministering at the end of the service. If you're in person, we'll have some ushers standing at the back door that you can give or on our app or website. There's a drop down that says guest speaker and uh, whatever goes into that fund, we will give to Joe. We want to be a blessing to him as well, but we thank him for his investment coming to Generations Church. Would you welcome to our platform this morning our friend Joe Phillips? <clears throat> Praise God. Good morning, everybody. I love your pastors, Pastor Brian and Becky Nugent. It's such an honor, tr tremendous honor to be here. I rode uh, all through the night and got, got in um, about 1 o'clock, and I was thinking, the guy who sold me the truck that I was driving, my friend, an African-American, all-American preacher boy, his name is Stanley Ridley. I've taken him with me on occasion. He had a heart transplant younger than me, and, uh, and he, he re desperately wanted to be an evangelist. And, and he passed four, four years ago. I'm not allowed to complain about one thing on earth, no, nothing uh, about being an evangelist because he would love to have done it. And there are a lot of people that would love to do it. And no matter how the struggle is, I am blessed, highly favored, and I'm honored to do this. And there is a different function and an unction and an anointing on the gift of the evangelism. Uh, we're not better. I pastored. And, and I've been an evangelist. I understand the difference. And I appreciate a pastor who wants the gift of the evangelist for his church. And if you're away from God, I got some great news for you. You don't have to be away from God when you go to bed tonight. You can put your head on the pillow and know that to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. Pastor Brian's an Alabama fan, pastoring a church on Tennessee Street. Former Kentucky DYD checks out. You know, I'm an Alabama fan too. And I went to the national championship game a couple of years ago. My son, I, I was in Columbus, Mississippi. I was in um, Tupelo, Mississippi. And my son called me on a Sunday night and said, Dad, I go to Indianapolis. I'm buying you a ticket to the national championship game. He's an Ohio State fan. He's a weirdo. But he loves his dad. <laughs> and, uh, and we went. But we had to sit with the Georgia people. And we're in the mezzanine behind all the Georgia athletes' families. And when they threw that pick and... Uh, broke my heart and, and that guy came back and did that pick six and d destroyed us there was unbridled joy in the in that mezzanine i mean there were grown men hugging each other that did not know each other they were invoking the memory of their dead relatives they were weeping there was so much joy that i caught myself pastor brian high five and two or three of them and said what am i doing <laughs> not a fan of that. but joy is contagious you know what else is contagious? Revival. When you fast and pray for 21 days, something's going to happen. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's good to see my friend James that came and my dear cousin Marcy. Oh, well, you go by Lynn now. I haven't seen you in about 15 years. I can't wait to get down and hug your neck. I thought that was you. And uh, when you waved, it confirmed it. And all the rest of you, friends. Listen, I... I uh, in my, my latter years, I, I want to maximize everything I can for the Lord Jesus. And so JPM is Jesus Productions and Message. And uh, we've made a film that the Inspiration Network has on their streaming platform. 
but I'm going to give it to you uh, for free. I'd like to show you the real quick trailer before I preach the message that the Lord put on my heart for you all today. This film is called Aren't You Somebody? And I filmed it in Thailand in 2019, and I was supposed to, uh, and I was supposed to um, premiere it March 19th. 2020. I don't know if you got the COVID down here, but it was hitting us up there in North Carolina. So it knocked us out. But uh, I decided I, I was going to just give this film to the whole wide world. Here's a trailer, but I'll, I'll caution parents. If you get this film, and I'm going to show you how to do it for free in a moment. Uh, it is about trafficking, so the subject matter is very heavy. All right, this is Aren't You Somebody, a trailer. I can't get that little girl's face out of my mind. Somebody needs to stop this. Help me understand this again. Why are we going to this village? The statistics are one million. One million little boys and girls are prostitutes in Southeast Asia. I do have a question. Certainly. How can I stop the trafficking of little boys? I know that women can be looked down upon in this culture, especially Akka women. But you are perfect. You are somebody. Are you somebody? QR code up there. You're welcome to scan that, and you can have it for free of charge if you know how to do that. I'm 100 years old, so I, I really don't know how to do that kind of stuff. The, um, the message, Aren't You Somebody, lends itself to our LLC, Be Somebody. My friend was over in 1986, and he was pounding the table saying, somebody needs to stop this. And the Thai pastor looked at him and said, you're somebody. Aren't you somebody? And so be somebody came out of that. If, yeah, we are somebody that can make a difference, so be somebody. There's, here's the next project. If you just throw that screen up, uh, it's called Irrevocable. It's a novel. I've spoken with a couple of uh, film, filmmakers about this, waiting on the right situation. But um, this is about, this is about a, a minister whose life ex imploded, exploded, and uh, he ran from God for 30 years and dramatically comes back. I'm more pleased with this project than anything that I've ever done, Ebenezer or any of that stuff. And so when you go to the resource table and buy that hat, I was given all of that stuff away for donations, but the hats are so expensive I attached a value to it. But this book, 3 for 30, it is for donation. If you need to be encouraged and you don't have a lot of money, I'm taking anything from a cough drop, but not the one at the bottom of your purse. It's sticky, it's gross, it's got hair on it. I don't need that one, but a new cough drop I'll take. And uh, anything from a nickel to a million dollars, my, my uh, accounting people get nervous about anything over a million dollars. But you can have this. It's 30 for 30, 30 story, three words a day for 30 days, and they're just stories, and it's a devotional book, and I think it will bless your life. Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11. I would like to tell you that following my message today, I want to pray for sick people. I want to pray for all the sick people, all the people that need a touch from God. I'm going to talk fast, so you're going to have to listen fast. And I'm going to quote a lot of scripture, but I'm not going to give you the reference. If you want the sermon, I'll, I'll email you the sermon free of charge. Joe at JoePhillipsMinistries.com. Two L's. Joe at JoePhillipsMinistriesPlural.com. And you can have all the verses because there are going to be quite a few of them before we pray. And that exhausts my list. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. You said in Mark 9, this kind comes out but by prayer and fasting. And Lord, when a group of people decide to fast, not to get a badge or not to, to draw attention to themselves, but to crucify their flesh, when a group of people fast and pray and seek your face, you do extraordinary things. And we feel your presence here, Lord. We sense your your nearness. Lord, you've been doing great things here for a long, long time. 
And I pray that today would be no exception, that you will heal bodies, deliver people, encourage people, those who are away from you that do not know you, that, Lord, they'll come to know you as their Savior and their best friend before they leave this place today. Our prayer team is praying. This prayer team is praying. Lord, you're here. So we earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. That's what you told us to do. Help me to prophesy, to tell what's on your heart to these, your people today. And then, Lord, in about 30, 40 minutes, I pray that there will be signs and wonders in our midst for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Before I read the text, I'll just set it up by saying something happens to me every year. I, uh, I play Ebenezer Scrooge, and I played Ebenezer Scrooge to uh, uh, 43,000 people over the last 11 or 12 years, 11 different states, 41 cities, including this very stage right here. 1,326 people have come to know the Lord. But there's something that happens every year as I do this. I get stuck in it, and I can't get out of it, and I just speak Scrooge for about a month and a half. It drives my family crazy. I don't get out of it. I don't get out of it until about February. What do you mean you speak Scrooge? I mean, I may be at a dinner table, and the kid will say, hey, Dad, you want another Roll, I do not want, I do not need any roll of any sort, least of all a butter roll. They just roll their eyes. I, they know it's going to take me six weeks. I'll be right by myself doing it. If I find something I've, I've been looking for, my keys, these are my own keys and all just as they were. My family just begs me to get out of it. And I usually get out of it by the middle of February. Because here's the deal. Once you learn something, albeit with a few exceptions, but once you learn something, it is very difficult to unlearn that. It just stays with you. Our text is from Matthew 11 and Philippians chapter 3. Matthew 11 says, if you put that on the screen, Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon I may know in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. This morning before we pray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about learning the Lord. Learning the Lord. Learning is a powerful thing. Uh, all of you educators in the room, uh, uh, we tip our hats to you every year and we should do it every day. Learning is very, very powerful. There's something I, I've discovered about learning. I speak a little Spanish, very little, but I'm a comedian, so I imitate people. And every now and then, I'll pray in Spanish. I may, I may come to a, a, a platform, and before I preach, Gracias, Señor, por este día, por la sangre de Cristo, por la cruz del Calvario, gracias por la esperanza del cielo. And people will walk up to me who are, Hispanic and begin to speak to me and I'm looking at them like a cow looking at a new gate because I don't understand what they're saying because <laughs> I have a problem. I got two problems. Number one, I only speak Spanish in the present tense. Try doing that in English. It does not work. You cannot communicate without the past, past preterite, future perfect and all of that. And the other, I have to translate everything. Like if I'm in Barloche, Argentina, or Managua, Nicaragua, and I need to use the restroom, I think, okay, I, yo, need, necesito, the bathroom, el baño. Yo, oh, yeah, yo necesito el baño. Ahora, that means now. <laughs> <laughs> but people who are fluent in language, they do not have to interpret the language, they think in the language. 
It's just in their brain. I talked to a, a lady who does sign language. She says she dreams in sign language. I want to, even at my advanced age, in 2023, become, I want to become fluent in the Lord. I, I don't want to have to translate. We have too many translating Christians who, who have to stop and want. I want to think the Lord. The Bible says, learn of me. Jesus said, learn of me. Paul says, I want to learn him. I want to know him. The, these are the 12 books that I've, uh, 12 Bibles that I've read cover to cover. I'm not bragging or complaining. I'm, I, I've been a Christian 40 years. It should be 40. It's just 12. That one on the bottom, Lynn, that one Grammy gave me, Christmas of 1982, 40 Christmases ago, and all these others, and, and reading these books. Now, there one is the Amplified. It took me 11 years to read the Amplified. <laughs> There's a principle and a paradigm that has guided our ministry and has guided my marriage and family, and I wrote it last month, and I want to share it with you. Learning the Lord. That's what we're talking about today. It's a very important principle. Paul says, I want to know Jesus Christ experientially. I don't want to know just stuff about him. I want to experience Jesus more than a head knowledge. And I'm willing to lose everything. I'm willing to count everything as garbage and rubbish if I can just learn the Lord. If I can just know him, we can learn stuff in life. You go to your job interview and they say, um, your resume is quite impressive. Are you proficient in Excel spreadsheets? And if you don't know it, don't lie. But you usually will say, I'm going to be a great employer, employee, Mr. Employer. Uh, I don't know Excel, but I can learn it and I'm a quick study. We can learn Excel spreadsheet. We can learn Microsoft. We can learn code. We can learn law. We can learn Arabic. We can learn Spanish. If we can learn all that stuff, we can certainly learn Lord. And I want to learn him more than I ever have, that I may know him, not read about him, not preach about him, know him, no translating. I want to think in Lord. I was in a Deep South uh, conference of ministers Years ago, I'm talking to these ministers and I'm wrapping it up and the Holy Spirit said, give an invitation to receive my son Jesus, or give the, 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 the father's son Jesus. And I said to the Lord, I'm, I'm just arguing with him as I'm praying. I'm like, that's a bad career move, Lord. You know where I'm at. <laughs> that won't go well on the chat line. And he wouldn't let up. You know when he tells you to do something, you got to do it. You got to believe it. I read in the hotel early this morning, again in Luke chapter 1, the one guy, the father of John the Baptist, he didn't believe it. And he got to be mute for several months. But, but the young teenager girl, Mary, when, when the Gabriel said, you, you're going you're gonna to be this, she said, I believe it. And she didn't get to be mute. So I said to the assembled crowd, I said, uh, Bow your heads. I know, I'm almost mad. I know where I'm at, and I know who you are. I understand that, but the Lord won't let me up on this. i got to be obedient. If you want to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, minister, raise your hand, and the dude with the biggest ministry in the room raised his hand. He knew ministry, but he did not know Lord, and he needed to learn him. I'm picking a metaphor today. To finish this message, the metaphor is higher education. When you graduate from high school, college is not for everybody, but if you want to go to college, you want to go as far as you can, you've got to go in stages. You've got to go and get degrees. And we're going to talk about three degrees. I'm going to spend most of my time unpacking the first and second. The third one I'm going to spend 30 seconds on, so don't get nervous. Don't get nervous. Learning the Lord. Let's get some degrees. Let's get some degrees. We make it our goal to please him, whether at home in the body or away from it, the Bible says. I want to please the Lord this year. I, but if you're going to please the Lord, or you're going to please your spouse, you need to know what their expectation is, and to know the expectation, you have to know them. So I want to please the Lord. I want to know what his expectations are. And so I want to become fluent. 
I don't want to translate. Corinthians says you did not learn Christ this way. If you, can't, if you learn something wrong, you got to learn it right. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take three degrees here for the last few moments of this message. And we're going to start where Paul started with the master's degree. Now, I know you got to get a bachelor's first. We're going to get to that. But he started here, so I'm going to start here. He says, I want to know Jesus in the power of his resurrection. If we're going to be a mentee, we have to do what the mentor says. And our mentor Jesus said, follow me, and I'm going to make you something. Our mentor said, I gave you an example that you should do as I've done. Paul says in Philippians, we want to have this attitude, the same mind that was in Jesus Christ. First John says, if anyone says they walk with him, they need to walk like Jesus walked in the same manner. So if we're to walk like Jesus, follow Jesus, operate in his example and his attitude, then we have to walk in the very power of God, the power of the resurrection. And that's exactly what he did. If you just do a quick Google search, if you're a new believer, you'll find at least 37 miracles right off the bat. Jesus walked in miraculous power, and we're supposed to follow him and do what he did. He, he did natural miracles. He cursed a fig tree. He turned water into wine. He calmed the storm. He walked on the water. He uh, had a miraculous catch over here, and then another miraculous catch of fish. He did amazing things. He healed people of every manner of disease, of, of leprosy, blindness, deafness, lame. He healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. Couldn't heal her of being the mother-in-law of the guy, but healed her of the fever. He, he, he said, stretch out your hand. He spit in people's eyes, and they were healed. He was a miracle worker. He walked in power, and that's what Paul said. I want to walk in that power. He, he cast out demons on several occasions, raised the dead at least three or four times. Jesus is the epitome of power, and Paul says, that's exactly what I want to do. Can we agree that Jesus walked in miraculous power? Can we agree that Paul wanted to learn and know and walk in that power? He said, my speech is not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And can we also agree, I sound like I'm at the House of Commons, would the good gentleman from Brighton agree the economy is in the tank? Can we also agree that there is nothing more powerful than the resurrection? I study comedians. There's a famous British comedian who's a famously an atheist, multimillionaire, brilliant comedic mind. But he says, if, uh, if I were to talk to God, and I don't believe there is a God, if I would say to God, why, why do babies die? Why do bad things happen? If that dude asked me the question, every single answer would be this. Great question, the empty tomb. Great question, the empty tomb. The empty tomb answers Everything. It is all power. Spurgeon says it is the ark of our holy faith. Without the empty tomb, it crumbles into nothing. Paul said, that is, is exactly how I want to know Jesus. And he did. He did some amazing things. Jesus healed people of blindness. Paul actually gave a guy blindness, Elamus. I don't know where you can get that spiritual gift, but it might be kind of cool. <laughs> Rude clerk at Target. Oh, really? I can't talk to your manager? How about this? Psh, you're blind. How you like me right now? That's why God doesn't give us that gift. <laughs> Paul had handkerchiefs go out from his body. In Acts chapter 19, Paul raised the dead, a kid named Eutychus. Paul did some incredible things. He healed uh, a, a man named Publius's dad. And the, uh, the whole island of Malta came to know Jesus. Paul got bit by a snake, shook it off in the fire because he wanted and he learned to walk in the power of the resurrection. I love what Chuck Colson says about the resurrection. He, he, he says, I know that the resurrection is real and Watergate proved it to me. 12 men for 40 years said Jesus raised from the dead rose from the dead. They never altered their story, not one time. They were beaten, tortured. They were, they were stoned. They were put into prison. and they, they were killed and martyred, and not one of them ever changed their story. Watergate embroiled 12 of the world's most powerful men, and we couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me that these men could do it for 40 years? Impossible. Paul said, 
That's what I want. I want. But he says this. I want to know Jesus first before the power and all the I want to know Jesus. COVID exposed us in the church universal of doing stuff that did not matter. What matters is that we might learn of him, that we might know him. And this is the master's degree. This is the master's degree. So in 2023, if we want to make everything else seem like rubbish, there are degrees that we need to attain. There are classes we need to take. So now let's talk about the first degree. That's the bachelor's degree. The fellowship of his sufferings. This is why more people don't get to, to the master's level. Because this one throws them. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, but the fellowship of his suffering. Matthew says, if anyone wishes to come after me, Jesus speaking, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Peter says, for this cause, you've been called for this purpose. He suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. This degree is at odds with the prosperity gospel preachers, and I am a prosperity gospel preacher. I believe in the blessing of God. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow to it. I believe in the power of the tongue. Out of the man's mouth, his stomach is filled with good things. 2 Corinthians 4, 13, having that same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore we speak. I believe in the blessing of God, and I pray for that every single day for my family. But here's where I'm a little different than the main line. I believe that part of the prosperity of God is this degree right here of going through seasons of suffering. Spurgeon says when we suffer for our sins, we're in a dark place. I'm not talking about suffering because of the devil or, or being harassed by the devil. I'm talking about the other thing that we're going to get into today. Some of you have experienced pain in 2022. 2022 was a great year for JPM. In 2022, we went to 22 states. It was fantastic, but not all years are like that. And maybe your year last year leaves you in a place where you were at loss so much that you feel like a loser, that things did not go your way, and you feel like a second-class citizen. There's something wrong with you. I have come to Tallahassee. By the way, that novel that I mentioned earlier, it ends with the, with, the, with the man going to Tallahassee, Florida and being encountered with, with the Holy Spirit on the way to Tallahassee. I've got Tallahassee in that book. It's pretty cool. I've come here to Tallahassee, Florida to encourage you that feel like you're second class or that you're, you've lost so much that you feel like a loser. If, if you're going to get a degree, it takes about 120 hours, I think, to get a bachelor's degree. And, and uh, you look at the degree and you look at the course descriptions and then you pick the course and then you look at the syllabus. So we're going to look at some course descriptions for this degree. We're going to look at some classes that you have to take and they come from Isaiah 53. That's the Lord's degree. And then Paul experienced it in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and we'll put a few of them up on the screen. Number one, if you're gonna get this degree, you gotta take the class of being unnoticed, unnoticed. There is no beauty that we should desire him, Isaiah 53, two. We did not esteem him. The voice translation said, he didn't look like anything or anyone of consequence. Perhaps you spent the last season of your life feeling very inconsequential, that you're overlooked, that everybody else seems to get the promotion and the advancement and you're just in the shadows all the time. I'm here to tell you, you may be taking one of his classes and on the other side of that class, there's something very powerful. Here's another class, hated, he was despised. None of us want to take that class, but it happens. Paul told Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul was shipwrecked. He was certainly uh, in a place that nobody desired him. He was alone. Rejected. See, uh, that's another class. It's like Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. This is uh, Hatred 2. Rejected by men. Paul experienced this in Acts 9. All the disciples were afraid of him. Jesus was rejected. And some of you have been fired. And man, it, it hurts. It stings. The whispers. And some of you have experienced this class in the most painful of ways, when a spouse walks in and says, I don't want you anymore, there is a depth of pain there 
that you are actually fellowshipping in the suffering of Jesus who himself was also rejected. There's another class, sadness, a man of sorrows. And here's algebra two for sadness, grief, acquainted with grief. And some of you experienced grief last year, real grief. And people will say, you got to get, o- you, you get over that. Really, Turbo? You want me to get over the loss, this grievous loss? The scripture says godly men mourned greatly for Stephen. It's godly to grieve. You can't stay in it forever as those who have no hope, but you don't get out of it prematurely. And if you're in it right now, you are in the class of fellowshipping with the Lord because he was grieved. He was avoided. It says, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, just like they did for the apostle Paul. It's one thing to be unnoticed. It's one thing to be hated. It's a whole other thing when you're walking down the hall at work and they see you coming and they duck into another room because they can't stand to even go by you. That's, that hurts. Stricken and smitten. Here's the difference between stricken and smitten. Stricken is to be smacked, smacked as with an open hand. But, but, but smitten is to be hit as by, the dictionary says, a torpedo. Some of you felt like you got torpedoed in 2022. Sick, he was afflicted. Paul says, for even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God, to keep me from being proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Someone I heard on television said, well, uh, obviously the apostle Paul didn't really understand the principles of God. Really? He was caught up in the third heaven. Where you been? I hop. I think he understood stuff. He was afflicted, hurt, wounded. He was wounded, verse 5 says. Paul says, I've gone without sleep, and I've known hunger and thirst, and I've been cold and naked. Another class is oppression, not oppression of the devil per se, but the Bible says in verse 7, Jesus was oppressed. And Paul says, I daily feel the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And confinement is one of the classes that we need to take. He was taken from prison. Paul says, I've been in prison more frequently. My comedian buddy from Birmingham, Big Lee McBride and I, we had a photo shoot three weeks ago in Concord, North Carolina, in the Cabarrus Jail. We got orange jumpsuits, and we got orange Crocs, and we got locked in, and it was very, very creepy. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. We were doing a photo shoot for a project. And let me just tell you something. We were able to get out. Some people can't get out. They can't get, they feel confined. Maybe you feel confined by your circumstances. You're in a class right now. He was cut off from the land of the living. He was dead. Paul says, I've been exposed to death again and again. And I was even lowered from a basket through a window. So God is calling us to be patient in our suffering. Now, this, this, is, this sounds heavy, but this is good news. We're coming to the good news part of it. He wants us to be patient in affliction, the Bible says. The early apostles believed suffering was what prepared us for heaven. Going through times of difficulty and challenges prepared us. Peter urged, and I love this, because when something like being smitten or stricken or lonely or rejected, when that happens to us, we feel like there's something wrong with us. And occasionally there's something we've done, but a lot of times it's just the class we're in. And Peter said, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through as though something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his sufferings so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory that's revealed to the world. Paul told that church in Colossae, I'm I'm glad when I suffer in my body for I'm participating in the sufferings of Christ. The definition of fellowship, according to the 1826 Webster's definition, fellowship means companionship, a mutual association on friendly terms, a partnership or joint interest. In pain, the Spirit of God takes me and you to places that we've never been before so that we can take others to places that they have never been before. It's a dimension of God. There's a dimension of God that only happens when we're broken. 
There's a closeness that only happens when we're broken. Isaiah says, I, I'm the high and lofty one. I'm the holy one, and I live in the high and holy place. But also with those whose spirits are contrite and humble to restore the spirit of the crushed one. When you're at the casket of somebody who died prematurely, like our friend Tom Green last week in Oklahoma that buried him prematurely, shocked us all, statesman for this movement, too young to die. When we cry at the casket of our loved ones, we're doing something very unique on the earth because in heaven there are no more tears. So as we process through that, I think it's so precious that the Lord collects our tears in heaven. There ain't no more tears up there. I was in a camp of one of our mutual friends, and I did a morning session, and everybody left except uh, one youth pastor. We got to talking, and he said, man, I just got out of jail about eight weeks ago. I was a felon. I'm thinking, our friend didn't really screen very well this application. <laughs> this one got under the radar. And I was glad, too, because the guy was full of Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost. He was telling me all about prison, getting saved in prison, and all the years he spent there. And I said to him, I said, I got, a, I got an amoral question for you. It's not immoral. It's amoral. And there's no right or wrong. And if it's too personal, just tell me. It's none of your business, Joe. The Greek word is nunya. It's nunya. It's none your business, Joe. I said, is there anything about prison that you find yourself actually missing? You miss being there. And his eyes filled with tears immediately. And he looked left and right. And he goes, yeah, I thought I was crazy. I said, I bet I know what it is. You missed the intimacy with the Lord, the closeness, because you didn't have a lot of distractions. There wasn't no cell phone or computer. There wasn't no job to clock in and clock out of. It was you and Jesus. He said, that's it. That's what I miss. And when you and I are confined or crushed or broken, you're going to get through it and get on the other side with power, but in the middle of it, recognize, whew, recognize the closeness that you have with the Spirit of God. He's hovering over you. He's dwelling over you. He, he's loving you in a, in a powerful, powerful way. I, I remember pastoring. I didn't pastor a great church like this. That's why I know the difference in the pastoral unction and evangelistic function. When I was a pastor, uh, it, it was just different. When I go to an evangelistic field, if, there, if there's a church that's in an interim situation and there's no pastor and we preach a sermon and the little old ladies will come up and say, oh, we wish you were our pastor. We, we, we would have services like this every week. <laughs> no, you wouldn't because I did it for three years and we almost never had a service like this. I remember a lady came out of the balcony for an evangelist named Rick Pasquale, and, and, and she was at the altar, and I walked by, and this was my holy thought. Well, you rascal, I preach better than that evangelist, and you've never moved once from the balcony. <laughs> and the Lord just kind of revealed in that moment, it's not about you or Rick. It's the unction, the function, the anointing and, of the office. And I remember sitting on the Ohio River, pastoring 57 to 74 people. When we hit 100, I called Charisma to see if they wanted to send a team down to study our success. <laughs> On the backside of a mountain in Huntington, West Virginia. Sweet people. So I, I, I had time, more time than ever. And, and I used to make faith-filled declarations. I've been doing it for 20 years. It started on the Ohio River. Uh, and I was pastoring less than 100 people, and I'd say, uh, your servant creates outstanding growth resources for the body of Christ. And all, the, uh, all of these 10 things I would say, and I say it every day, almost every day. But I spent hours and hours and hours with the Lord, sitting on that river with my dog Dixie and my little iPod, whatever those little nothing, and, and the journal of the Bible, my speed to light chair. Now that I, I, I can hardly catch my breath and there's too many projects and there's too much stuff going and there's great opportunities, I catch myself missing those moments where it was just me and Jesus, hour upon hour upon hour. Lynn, when you were a little girl, uh, I, I, began, I began this walk with Jesus 40 years ago. The Lord asked me one time, says, Joe, you know when I was really proud of you? 
And here was my cavalier answer. I'm just talking to the Holy Spirit. I was in South Carolina doing a youth retreat somewhere in the mountains. I said, well, Lord, that's not a fair question. You've had so many opportunities. I don't know. I mean... I went through the Rolodex in my mind and started naming stuff. Does any of that stuff ring a bell, Lord? Is that it? He took me back to the double Y in Eufaula, Alabama. My grandmother loved two things on this earth, three things. She loved her family. She loved Joey Phillips. She loved professional wrestling and Christian television. And those two things were very similar in the 1980s. <laughs> And I came to the Lord in the summer of 82, and then when Grandpa died in November of 82, a lot of the family came to know the Lord, and prayed, said, I want to walk with Jesus. My Grammy, she was a chain smoker. I loved her. When she died, I visited her, and she, she said, thanks for coming, Joey. Took her oxygen off. I'm about to see Jesus. <laughs> Took a drag. I said, we all about to see him if you keep doing that. And she was, uh, there were 27 people in that double wide, and it was Thanksgiving. And she said, we ain't praying today until, until my grandson, we're not eating today until my grandson comes and prays for us. I was 18 years old. They looked everywhere for me. They couldn't find me. I was in the woods. I was in my practice uniform. It was unseasonably warm. I was like this, leaning against a tree in, in the 1982 basketball practice jersey. So you'd get arrested if you wore them today. And I was leaning against a tree, and I was talking to the Lord about my girlfriend, Cecilia, and about missing my grandpa. I just got lost. <laughs> I just got lost in his presence. I'd hurt so much in my life. And the Lord said, I was really proud of you that day, Joe. I was really proud of you. His metric's different than our metric. Completely different. We do not have a high priest that cannot be touched <coughs> with a feeling of our infirmities, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 5 says, a son though he was, Jesus learned obedience in the things he suffered. So now the last degree is 30 seconds. It's a doctoral degree. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him. We can't get this one until we go to heaven. So I'm good not getting this for a few more years. Paul says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished my course and all the courses. Now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will receive on that day. What on earth are you supposed to do with all of this information? Here's what I'm asking you to do. If you have graduated from suffering, stop auditing the classes. Well, I got my degree, but you know, I, I might want to get a refresher on being smitten. No, you don't. You've learned, <clears throat> move on. Some of you, though, even as I'm preaching, you resonate with some of those classes and some of those courses, and in your heart, you, you want to be through. Like Jesus said, let this class go. Let this cup pass before me. I, 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 but nevertheless, not my will, your will. Some of you realize you're only about halfway through it. What I'm asking for you is to be patient in affliction. And not become weary and well-doing. And I'm asking for all of us to walk in his power. And we're about to do that in just a moment as we believe God to set the captive free to heal people and to help people. In conclusion, I love 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with unveiled face beholding in the mirror the glory of the Lord were being transformed in the same image from glory to glory. Our light and momentary of troubles, the Bible says, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. They don't seem light or momentary, but they are. I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Jesus himself said, I've told you these things that you'll have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Lynn Anderson sang it. The old people will remember it. You young people will think it sounds like fingernails on a chalkboard. I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. That's why I don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> Along with the sunshine, 
There's got to be a little rain sometime. That's theology. That's theology. It's momentary and light and don't think it's strange. And you're going to walk through it and come out of it. And on the other side, there's going to be something extraordinary for you. Hallelujah. The last verse I'm going to quote is from the Boyce translation in Isaiah 53, verse 12. Because Jesus, and this is written hundreds of years before Jesus fulfilled it. Because he exposed his very self and laid bare his soul to the vicious gasping or grasping of death. And because he was counted among the worst, I will count him among the best. Show and tell time. I'm going to tell two stories and we're going to pray. August the 9th of last year in Bentonville, Rogers, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas, I ran five miles training for a 100-mile Appalachian Trail hike. I have a picture of that, that particular Tuesday. That's me. Now, running is a relative term. I mean, you could probably crawl and go that, about that fast, but I never stopped running with my 73-year-old buddy. He might have had to slow down for me a couple times, but I ran, and it was thumbs up. Like, yeah, man, this is going to be a piece of cake, 100 miles on the Appalachian Trail. Do that in my sleep. Three days later in Mount Rogers, Virginia, I walked six miles, didn't run a mile, didn't run a step, had a 20-pound pack on my back. And this is not a very flattering picture, but I want to show you the, the, the position that I was in. Right, <laughs> Yeah, I felt like three Florida State offensive linemen had hit me in the head and I'd been in a bar fight and lost horribly with these guys. I couldn't move and it exposed me as a fraud. And COVID exposed a lot of things as fraudulent, smoke and mirrors. And I realized I, I'm not going to be able to do this without a lot of suffering, without a lot of work. And show the last picture. I, I finished two years in COVID in the red, and we finished in the black. And those were the shoes that I walked 100 miles and was able to accomplish the goal. Lost four toenails. One of them said, bye, Felicia, forever, but I, it was worth it. And, and s some of you have a, a trail to walk. You want the power of God, but you're not patient in the, in the bachelor's degree. And the Lord is saying, be patient. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And the last thing I'll say is this. I want to give you two realities of our home and ministry. Reality number one, and I'm not bragging or complaining, and I don't promote myself like this. If somebody else wants to, that's fine. I understand a couple of things. Whosoever will can be saved, and I understand all the saved people can be candidates for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I get it. But when it comes to healing, I'm in sales and he's in management, and I don't understand all of it, but when I lay my hands on people, amazing things happen. Tumors shrink in Michigan. A kid named Levi, his jaw was pushed back, and his Assembly of God father and pastor says his bite is different, and he didn't have to have surgery. People in South Carolina would come through an altar, and they couldn't have children, and then Jesus healed them. I've seen blind eyes open in Alabama. I've seen skin disorders literally leave a person's body in Arkansas with my own eyes. That's a reality juxtaposed with another reality. My wife has been to the hospital four times by ambulance in the last two years. We thought she was going to die January 2nd, 2021 with a heart attack. They got her back in the ambulance. Not too long, even just a few months ago, two or three months ago, she passed out, and I slapped her face. And the doctor, the cardiologist says, slapping her face saved her life. They could read the internal heart monitor. I said, well, there's a, not a place for domestic violence, but you know, maybe, all right. I'm not funny. So how do these two pictures go side by side? Better men than me have prayed for my wife. How can that and that... Don't you feel like a fraud, Joe? I don't feel like a fraud because of what I just said. 
all of the reading of Scripture over the years, I've come to the conclusion that if you and I are going to be unnoticed, we need to go notice somebody. If we're going to be afflicted, we go heal somebody. If we're going to be smitten, we're going to speak life to somebody. No matter what we've been through, if we get through on the other side, there is power waiting on us there. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Bow your heads. Lord, thank you for this great church and what you want to do in this moment. You raised Lazarus from the dead, but he's still not walking around. He, he died with something. Something got him. But you raised him from the dead for a reason and for a purpose, and it, and it was glorious. You want to do something in our midst today, and even if you heal people of cancer and cardiac disease and sleep disorder and bladder cancer and, and uh, ringing them the ears and all manner of things, they have a shelf life like Lazarus the duration of their life. But what we're going to talk about in these 30 seconds has no shelf life. It's eternal. A million years is the first second of the first minute of the first day for that forever. I pray for those who are not walking with you that they will walk with you. Listen, friends, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm not going to belabor this, but do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if your heart stopped beating, that to be absent from your body, you'd be present with the Lord. You can know it. You can know it. Oh, Joe, nobody can know that. The Bible says, if you trust the Bible, these things are written that you might know you have eternal life. My only brother-in-law, four years ago on an August run, he was a 10-mile-a-day runner, 54 years of age, two-time national football champion at Georgia Southern. My only brother-in-law, he fell dead. He fell dead. I preached his funeral. Live your life in a way that the preacher doesn't have to lie at your funeral. I didn't have to lie at his funeral. And, and I was able to say to 2,000 people, my brother-in-law Danny's in heaven, not because he was a great athletic director or a great coach or uh, assistant principal, Sunday school teacher. My brother-in-law's in heaven because of what the Bible says in John 1. For as many as received Jesus, he gave them the power to become the children of God. When he was a younger man, he opened his heart and life like I'm asking you to do, and he gave his life to Jesus. Gave his life to Jesus. So the doctor said before his face hit the Georgia clay, he was dead. So if the doctor's right and the Bible's right, before my brother-in-law Danny Durham's face hit the Georgia clay, his feet hit streets that were paved with gold. And you can have that promise too. When I was on my way to Asheville and my daughter called me and said, Dad, the ambulance is here. I said, is it for Nana? No, it's for mom. Her heart's stopped. They're loading her in the ambulance right now. I made a U-turn, and I prayed in the Holy Ghost for 30 minutes until the peace of God flooded that cab. But there was one thing that I was at complete peace about, that if I didn't see her again on this side, I would see her on the other side because she'd received the gift of Jesus. Have you? I want to count to three as a point of reference and not as a gimmick. And when I get to the number three, I want you to raise your hand high. I'm going to pray with you right where you're at. I'm not going to interview you. I don't want to know what your sin is because I don't want you to know what mine is. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray and each one of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. One, Joe, I didn't need you to tell me I've had bad thoughts, said bad things, and done wrong stuff. I didn't need you to tell me that I haven't done what I'm supposed to do. I woke up this morning knowing that. It greets me every day. Two, I don't want to go to bed tonight the way I did last night. I want to put my head on the pillow and know that I know that I know that if I stopped breathing, I would breathe my next breath in heaven. I want to know that. You ready? I promise you, he's ready. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. When I say this number, I want you to raise your hand and leave it up for a beat or two, and I'll tell you to put it down. Why, why do you want us to do that, Joe? Jesus knows our thoughts, but he sees our faith, and I'm not Jesus. I, I want to see your faith because there's testimony in your faith. We overcome the devil by the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony and a hand raised saying, I want the gift of Jesus is a tremendous testimony. So when I say this number, if you're away from God, just slip it up and we're all going to pray together, okay? We're all going to pray together. You ready? 
three. Pray for me, Joe. Pray for me. Yeah, keep it up for a little bit. Keep it up. Keep it up. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Young and old, 12, 15, 20, I don't know. Everybody, please stand to your feet. Everybody stand to your feet. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray with you. And then uh, we're going to pray a, a simple choppy prayer together. And, and, and there will be a three-word prayer. It's just going to be a simple prayer. Then three words out loud, and then I'll pray for you at the end. I promise it won't take very long. God, thank you for these 18, 19, however many people that raise their hand that want to walk with you. That's your requirement. What does the Lord require of you, old man? You, you know what the Lord requires of you. The Bible says in the minor prophet that we would do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. And these hands raised say, I want to walk with God. So I pray that they'll understand what they're supposed to understand, that the, they'll make a U-turn, repent, go the other direction in the thing that grieves you, and that they will trust only in Jesus Christ for their eternal life, as they say, a simple prayer. You 18 to 20 people, all of you are valuable and precious I want you to just say some stuff like this to God. I'm going to stutter on purpose. Make it your prayer. In the middle, there'll be a three-word prayer. Just say this to Dear God, here I am. Dear God, this is me. Here I am, God. And I'm sorry, very sorry for my bad words, my bad thoughts, and the things I've done wrong. Forgive me. I didn't mean to hurt you like that. I confess my sin to you. I, I do. But I confess something else. At the count of three, from the front to the back, say these three words. Jesus is Lord, if you're comfortable. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Now back to our prayer. So I confess my sin, Lord, but I, I also confess Jesus is Lord. And I believe God raised him from the dead. And I don't understand all this. But I want all this. I want everything you have for me. I'll take all the classes. I want everything you got. I want to learn you. I want to know you. And I want to walk with you. And now, God, uh, this great church, Generations Church, Tallahassee, Florida, we pray for those who raised their hand and prayed that simple prayer that the roots are going to go way down deep and find living water, that the fruit of discipleship is going to go up high, and that, God, these people are going to make a difference forevermore in this world and in the world to come. They'll walk with you, and they'll love you, and they'll worship forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God some praise today. Hallelujah. Now, the pastor, do you want to transition to service before I pray for the sick, or you just want me to go for it? Good. I want to. I don't want you to come to this altar if you're standing in for somebody. I want you to come if you have something in your body. And if Jesus was walking by like those two blind men, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? We want to see. You know what you want. You want to be able to move your hands and arms without pain. You want to be able to breathe better. You want your orthopedic issues, your hip stuff, the vertebrae, all the stuff. You know what you need. I don't want you to come standing in for anybody because there's going to be a bunch of you. But those people are important and precious to you and to God. And if you know somebody that needs a healing in their body, would you raise your hand right now? Whew, there's an anointing on this. Lord, send help for the sanctuary. Send help from the sanctuary. Lord, help those that we have our hands raised. God, heal them. Help them. Those that are on oxygen, get them off of the oxygen. Those that have a diagnosis of death, give them a diagnosis of life. Lord, those that are struggling, help them. We pray you'll send help. Send your word to heal them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You put your hands down. Some of you need business or financial miracles. The Bible says in Romans, He that did not spare his only son but freely gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? If he can give you salvation, he can give you your rent payment. If you need God to work in this area, raise your hand. By raising your hand, you're saying, Lord, I'm willing to do what you say, 
to do what you say. But I need your help. I need your help. God, bless people in their businesses, their finances. Lord, bless them to, for all the provisions that they have need of. Lord, you give us everything we need for life and godliness. And we need to eat. We need to pay our bills. And we need to prosper and be blessed. And I pray you'd bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. The worship team is going to come. and Well, they're already, they've already gotten here. They're behind me. And they're going to sing is what I meant to say. And we're going to worship the Lord. And I'm going to come down and I'm going to pray for people like a kind of popcorn around. If there's a prayer team, you're welcome to come and help us. But I'm going to pray for everybody that comes. Kendra's back there at the table. I don't need to be back there. I want to be down here. I want to be praying for you. And I may yell. I'm just warning you in advance. My, my boys say, Dad, you got alter onset Tourette syndrome. You scare people to death. I don't know. When I speak to the mountain, sometimes I yell at the mountain. I yell at cancer. I know I can control it because if you go get your kid from Children's Church, I'm not going to scream at your baby. I'm only just telling that so it doesn't freak you out if it happens. We pray with the older people first if I can find you, old people like me. But I'm going to just kind of pop around. I may ask you what you want. If I do, keep it, keep it quick. I want God to heal my knee. I need God to heal. I need God to shrink this tumor, whatever it is. If I don't ask you, don't be offended. We're just going to pray for people. Father, ten lepers were cleansed, and one came back and thanked you. We're not competing with lepers, but we are saying before the first hand is laid on the first person, thank you, Lord, for everybody that you heal in this altar today. We worship you now, Lord. We believe.